Hey there, welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth Mayo. I'm the curator of astronomy in the Loma Planetarium at MOAS. And in this week's Sky Tonight program, we are covering the dates of October 11th through October 17th. We're going to start things off by talking about Jupiter and a great transit of one of its moons, creating a shadow across its cloudy bands, and the great red spot will come into view that same evening. Then we're going to talk about the moon sliding in between Jupiter and Saturn uh, in the middle of the week. And then we'll follow that up with a view of Venus getting very close to the red giant star at the heart of Scorpius, very low in the southwest. So let's get to it. At the very start of this week, on Monday, October 11th, we have a really cool telescopic event with the planet Jupiter. And as we've been saying these past couple months or even more, Jupiter and Saturn are really well placed in our sky, especially now because you find it right in the evening sky after sunset. So here on the 11th of October, you, you find Jupiter and Saturn here in the southeast. Jupiter, of course, is the brighter one compared to Saturn, but they're going to both look like non-twinkling star-like objects. That's a great way to decipher between a planet and a star. So if you have binoculars, or even better, a telescope, and you take a look at Jupiter at the beginning of the evening, especially if you're on the east coast of the Americas, for eastern daylight time, starting right around sunset, and right when it starts to get dark, is a good time to view the transit of a moon going across Jupiter. So let's take a look at what's going on with this transit. So we're gonna zoom in, get a little closer, a little closer, and as we do, we'll get that kind of telescopic view. Let's say we have a really big telescope, so we're gonna get really, really close. And as we do, you're gonna find, of course, Jupiter, this big, large gas planet, the largest in our solar system, and then these kind of little dots, almost like little stars around it. And you don't have to have a large telescope to see them. Even a small telescope, even binoculars at times, if you have steady hands, can reveal these moons here. And these moons are quite interesting. These are called the Galilean moons. They were discovered by the very famous Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei in the 1600s. Or at least Galileo was one of the first to ever see them through a telescope. And they sure are quite extraordinary to see around the planet, just to know that these are other moons besides our own around a distant system that's hundreds of millions of miles away is a cool thing to witness with this system here. And just recently, I performed a show for our Moaz Guild, an Italian-themed show where I had a chance to talk about Galileo. And in 1610, in January of that year, starting on January 7th, Galileo took his early telescope and pointed towards Jupiter and saw these little dots. And he was quite interested by them because from night to night, they seem to change position. And if we did that here in Stellarium, you can actually see that. You'll go to one night versus the next, and you see they kind of move around. And at the time, Galileo thought they're just these kind of weird stars. But what he realized is that these objects are going around Jupiter. And that was a big deal because in that time period, the Catholic Church was very firm in the idea that Earth is still the center of the universe. That's the geocentric idea, the Aristotelian, the Ptolemaic view of the universe, that Earth is perfect, everything should be going around the Earth, and, and nothing else should have things going around them. So when Galileo saw this, it confirmed his strong feeling that that's not how things work and that the sun should be placed in the center of the solar system. The heliocentric idea first really pushed forward heavily by Nicholas Copernicus, well before Galileo, actually. And Galileo was very, very defiant about that idea. Of course, we know today that is correct. The sun is in the center of the solar system. But this was one of the ways to confirm that not everything just goes around the Earth, seeing little moons of Jupiter go around the planet. And he was so mesmerized by these objects, he actually named them the Medicean stars, named after Cosimo de Medici, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, of course, part of that very famous and wealthy Medici family during that time. And so he wanted to name them after him, since he's a patron of Galileo. Eventually, they've been come to known as the Galilean moons to honor him. Nowadays, we know that there are actually 79 confirmed moons around Jupiter and possibly more to be confirmed 
as well. So these are by far the largest moons around the planet. So getting back to this transit event, occasionally the moons will cross our view of Jupiter in such a way, or at least get into a position where their shadows will fall on Jupiter. So this is at the beginning of the transit on the 11th on that Monday, and you'll notice a shadow of a moon right there, all right? So this is the moon Ganymede. That is the largest moon in the solar system. It's number one. Just for reference here, our moon is number five, and Ganymede is about one and a half times bigger than our moon, roughly speaking, so it is big. You can almost call it a minor planet in a way. So it is a really interesting object there, and a place that we know has icy kind of rocky environment. There may be a global ocean underneath some of that surface. And recently, we actually highlighted a video that was provided by NASA's Juno spacecraft that has been flying around Jupiter and now is in an extended mission to study some of the moons of Jupiter as well. And recently, it flew by Ganymede, one of the first spacecraft to do so in about 20 years. And it gave us these amazing images up close of Ganymede and its interesting surface. So on the 11th, this large moon will be casting a shadow on Jupiter's cloudy bands that you can see here. And for the east coast of the United States, especially this part of the world, we're going to see it at a really convenient time right after sunset. And if I speed through time here, you'll actually watch the transit kind of play out a little bit more. And this will run until about 10.20 to maybe 10.30 in the evening. And you can see the shadow kind of move across, or really as Jupiter is rotating. And Jupiter has a very quick rotation. Its day is just less than 10 hours. It is a very, very fast rotating planet. So you can see that unfold quite quickly over the course of even several hours. Now, this is not just visible in the East Coast. If you're in the Midwest of the United States or even the West Coast, you just have to stay up later for it to be darker in the sky to see this transit and you'll see kind of the later portion of it once it's dark in those locations. So it can be seen over a very large area of the United States, but the East Coast has very ideal conditions for this transit. But what you'll also notice is that this big spot is here as well. Now the position of this might be off by just a little bit, but we do know that the great red spot, this massive storm swirling in the atmosphere of Jupiter will also be visible as well. This is a big, big storm. We think the largest storm in the solar system. It's pretty well known, it has an iconic color to it and it's been around for at least a few hundred years, if not longer. It is going through some interesting fluctuations. It's actually shrinking, and it's shrunk quite a bit over the last hundred years. And scientists still not entirely sure why that is. Some people think it's gonna disappear at some point, and others think maybe not. Maybe it's just going through a few different fluctuations, and it won't disappear. But it has been shrinking. It's still one and a half times the size of Earth. If you can imagine a storm that large and this is a storm that rotates in about six earth days and it rotates counterclockwise so it's what's called an anti-cyclonic storm so that will also join the transit of ganymede's shadow which is a really cool effect there so if you do have the right equipment and you have a chance to be at the right time and you have a clear sky in the right part of the united states especially then you might have a chance to see the transit of the shadow of Ganymede across those beautiful cloudy bands of Jupiter, along with the great red spot on Monday evening, the 11th. Starting off this week as well, we do find the waxing crescent moon in our evening sky, but what's kind of nice is that as you move through the week, you're gonna find the moon get closer and closer to Jupiter and Saturn, which we just talked about. So we're gonna move ahead to Tuesday the 12th and then Wednesday the 13th, but then by Thursday the 14th here this week, you're gonna find the moon really nicely positioned between Jupiter and Saturn. Not directly between, but it's sort of in that vicinity and you'll find the moon will be a waxing gibbous shape. So it's gonna be more than half full. So that'll be kind of a nice treat, especially if you're a photographer or just kind of just wanna see, or if you, or if you just wanna see a nice grouping of solar system objects with our own moon, again, the fifth largest moon in the solar system, and with Jupiter right here to the left, Saturn, which is not as bright, to the right here, another great planet to look at through a telescope, of course, because of those rings, and even a couple moons or so around Saturn too. So that'll be nice to have the moon well-placed 
between those planets. And as you continue through the week and into the weekend, we're gonna find the moon move past Jupiter there. And this is on Friday. And then we'll get into Saturday and Sunday when the moon is getting closer and closer to a full moon that will happen next week. By the end of the week, we have another great example of an object seemingly getting close to another prominent object in the sky. So actually, this is the beginning of the week again, and what we're gonna look at is in the southwest, right after sunset, you're gonna find Venus right here, the brightest planet that we can see in the sky. And what we can do is speed up time, and as we do, Venus moves pretty quickly at times in our sky. So as we go through the week here, we're gonna see Venus move kind of more to the south. And as it does so, it's nearing this reddish looking star right here called Antares. So we can keep watching this happen as we get into the weekend here. We're out Friday, and then by Saturday and Sunday, but Saturday the 16th is where you're gonna find Venus and the star Antares at their closest. So this is a nice conjunction of these two objects in the sky. We'll get a little closer just to give us a better view. And as we've talked about Antares before, this reddish star that you find there is the heart of Scorpius the Scorpion that is now setting, that is this leftover summertime constellation. So it's pretty well known as the heart of Scorpius. So that star is a lot dimmer than Venus. Of course, Venus is the brightest planet and way closer than this star. Antares happens to be about 550 light years away. So the light from Antares takes about 550 years to travel from it to reach us here on Earth. But Venus, on the other hand, is a lot closer. Here in Solarium, if this is accurate, it says about 114.5 million kilometers away from us, which is about 71 million miles from Earth, or the light travel time about six minutes, compared to 550 years for Antares. So quite a bit closer, obviously making it quite a bit brighter. It's about 150 times brighter than the star Antares for good reason. And we've also talked about Antares before. It is one of the largest stars you can see with your naked eyes in the sky. Some estimates put it around 680 times the size of our sun. That's huge. So roughly speaking, it would fit somewhere between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter if you place the star where our sun is in the solar system. But the estimates for size are very rough. We're not actually entirely sure. When you get to really, really big stars, their outer layers are very tenuous and not very dense. So sometimes it's really hard to measure the exact size of a star that's very large. As they grow, the outer portions of the star get very thin and hard to measure at various wavelengths. So that's tough. And the problem is this star is sort of dying and it's pulsating or fluctuating in size too. So it also makes it more difficult there. The mass of the star is a little bit more accurate at about 12 times more massive than the sun. So it's a pretty hefty star. And what we had a chance to feature a while back, at least earlier in the year, is that this star is one of the best imaged ever besides our sun. And here is that image that was taken by what is called the Very Large Telescope Interferometer. This is a group of telescopes in Chile on a mountaintop, and if you combine the optics of multiple telescopes, that's called an interferometer, you can increase the resolving power of the telescope. And so that's what they did with the star, and is one of the best measured stars, again, other than our sun. And astronomers were able to measure the atmosphere in interesting ways and really figure out how the atmosphere is moving. And this animation kind of gives you an idea of kind of the oddity of the atmosphere. There is some movement of the gaseous envelope around the star that's acting in very peculiar ways that still have not been explained by modern understanding of red giant stars. And so that is still kind of a mystery yet to be solved, the movement of the atmosphere of Antares but it's fascinating and it's kind of neat they're able to take a picture as accurate as we've done with this star. Stars are actually really hard to take pictures of. Again, they're just really, really, really far away. And from this distance, they're just these tiny, tiny little dots. So it's hard to really get an understanding of them. But as we build bigger and better telescopes and better instruments, we're getting a better picture of these stars 
that are light years away. So that's kind of cool. So if you happen to be out in the evening this weekend coming up here, you find Venus, look just below it, especially on Saturday and Sunday, and you might be finding one of the largest stars you can see in the sky with your naked eyes, of course, the star Antares. Well, that's it for another edition of our Sky Tonight program. Thank you so much for tuning in. We always appreciate your support. And if you're in the area, if you're in Daytona Beach, please stop by the Museum of Arts and Sciences and definitely the Loman Planetarium. We're running shows every day and we got a lot of great programs coming up as well. So please check out our website if you want any more information about our schedule and what's going on. With that being said, we hope to see you back here again. So take care and of course, happy stargazing.